Before I pray, I want to say thank you to all the campuses and you here this evening for uh, praying for me and for being so kind to support me in these days of being absent. It was a remarkable and high and holy privilege to be with my father at the very moment when he breathed his last in Greenville, South Carolina on the 6th of March. Um, when parents have babies, they usually thank God for the gift of the baby. And uh, that's true, but it is the other way around, is it not, as often, that my father was a gift to me for 61 years of unspeakable proportion. And so I want to publicly thank God for him and uh, say that emotionally the way his departure has moved me most was not directly. I didn't cry the night as I stood, sat by his bed. I didn't cry. I sang and kissed him and waited and left. But I've cried over and over again. You know what happens when I look at people? When people love me. When they say things about my dad or just about the legacy. He comes at me indirectly through people. That's a good thing. I'm glad for that. And the last thing I think I would want to say is that with the death of my father, my mother's already gone, uh, it felt like another very decisive root was severed with Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, 34 years this has been home in the Twin Cities. But it's funny how when your parents are living, home is kind of where they are, kind of. And that's not true anymore. And I fully expect that I will not be buried in Greenville, South Carolina. I'll be buried up there where that one is up north or wood, whatever that one is down there. <laughs> And, and in all likelihood, I will lie right there, right there. And that's the way I would like it to be. I, that's a remarkable thing, not to be buried where your parents are buried. 1,100 miles, another world. And to raise your family in a church and in a place and that be home. And so that's a, a big sense of, as I came back to you, I felt like I was coming in a really profound sense home. So thank you very, very much for being here. And I hope enough of you are still around in a few years to come to my funeral. I hope it's a very happy one. Let's pray. Father in heaven, your word is precious beyond estimation. And now we undertake to think about it, herald it, exult over it, understand it, and then obey it and live it and have our marriages transformed by it and our lives altered deeply by glorious things. What would I have done had I not been able for two days to read the Word of God and sing the Word of God into my Father's dying ears? What would I have done? Turn on the television to a golf station because he liked golf? Thank you for your Word. Thank you. And now may your beauty Rest upon me as I seek lost marriages to win. And may they forget the channel, seeing only him. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If the Lord wills, today and a week from today, we will focus on what it means for a married man to be the head of of his wife and the head of his family for two reasons. Number one, verse 23, 
in Ephesians 5 says, the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. And we need to know what that means so that we can exult in it and live it, shape our marriages by it. The second reason is this. Few things are more broken today than manhood and headship in relation to women and families. And the price of that brokenness is enormous in our culture. It touches almost every facet of life. So for the sake of biblical exposition and our exaltation in His truth and for the sake of the rescue of biblical manhood and womanhood, we want to focus for two weeks on what it means for a married man to be the head of his wife and his family. A little review about where we've been since two weeks have elapsed since we were last on this. The emphasis has fallen in the five weeks we've been talking about marriage on the truth that Staying married is not mainly about staying in love. It's mainly about keeping covenant. And we did eventually get to the point where we said, keeping covenant is the best pathway to being in love in 40 years. Even if you're not for the first 20 or more likely, second 20. And then you are again. And that can't happen without covenant keeping. And so that's where the emphasis is falling. The first task of marriage is covenant keeping, not being in love. That's the second task. And when you get first things right, second things get better. And then we've spent the lion's share of our time trying to put foundations, gospel foundations, under the display of Christ in the church in marriage. We talked about the, the dynamics of, of vertical justification and vertical forgiveness and vertical forbearance coming down so graciously to us from God and, and husbands and wives bending it out to live it with each other, forgiving and forbearing and having a compost pile where they can throw all the stuff that never changes and frustrates the living daylights out of you and you don't have to pitch your tent by the compost pile. There are, there are paths and grassy knolls that one can spend a lot of time on, even if one has to go back to the pile every now and then and work on it again. And we talked last time, two, three weeks ago, that yes, in spite of the fact that we should forgive, and in spite of the fact that we should forbear, yes, we should help each other change. And there is a gracious way, a loving way, a humble way, a meek way, a hopeful way for us to grow together into the likeness of Christ. That's where we've been so far. So now the plan is, to take two weeks on what it means that a husband is the head of his wife, and then it will be Palm Sunday and Easter, and we will take a break. And then after that, between there and when I leave on writing leave in May, we will come back to the women and what does submission look like and singleness and divorce, something like that, whatever there's time to do. We will talk about those issues. So here we are. This message is mainly foundation, and next week will be mainly application with regard to 